Hello everyone and welcome back to part three of our series on escape and concealment. So uh, we were going to have part three be a continuation of the uh, restraint escape uh, and we were going to talk about uh, different kinds of European style, Russian, Czech style handcuffs and hand restraints. Uh, but we've actually hit a little bit of a snag. Uh, it turns out that uh, we, in our training exercises, uh, you know, internally here at the shop, have uh, snapped off uh, keys in all of the keyways of our foreign style handcuffs. So that's going to have to wait for a little bit while we get some more uh, imported in from Europe. So uh, yeah, that should sort of tell you as to how that episode's going to go. Um, but in order to put out as much content as possible, we already had this sort of part four ready. Um, but we're going to go ahead and put it, push it out as part three. And this series, uh, this particular episode in the series, is going to talk about our sort of seer kit type stuff. So this is the episode we're going to talk about uh, that we think is probably going to get a lot more traffic because everybody likes gear a lot more than, you know, sort of education or, or training right so we're going to go over all of the gear and stuff in our sort of sear setup now uh, the reason that we're talking about this and where we sort of got our motivation from is a few years ago quite a few years ago in 2013 uh, this whole sear kit ideology became very very popular and this happened because a, uh, a time magazine article was written about uh, in response to um, Special Warfare Group, uh, Navy, Dev Group, SEAL Team 6, whatever you want to call them, uh, they put out a solicitation for a brand new survival kit. And it was very intriguing um, because it was something that had not been, well, it it was kind of a new generation of survival kit. And in that kit were a few things like, you know, handcuff keys and handcuff shims and things like that. And that was very unique because that had not been seen uh, as a military survival kit for a very long time. In fact, most of the survival kits uh, from the military looked like, uh, sort of like this. Uh, you, you know, your Vietnam era, you know, um, line drawing, you know, uh, typewriter written survival kits. And that's, you know, that's something that the military had been working on for a very, very long time and uh, hadn't really sort of jumped past that Cold War slash Vietnam, you know, anywhere from you know, the 60s to like the 80s style of survival kit. They hadn't jumped into a new uh, era yet. So... Um, you know, DevGuru was looking for a new type of survival kit, and that sort of that solicitation was written into a Time Magazine article, and then quite a few different other entities jumped on board as well, and they thought, hey, this is pretty cool because this has got a lot of new technology in it. Um, so that exploded, uh, like I said, and a lot of companies sort of created um, their own versions, and this is where we sort of see the spin off and the creation of. A civilian style survival kit slash seer kit type thing, really, um, because seer isn't in and of itself um, is, is not necessarily a civilian uh, civilian sort of. Uh, program, if you will, um, and we we talk about this in part one. So if you haven't already, I forgot to mention, check out part one and part two, because that talks a lot about why we don't think Nasir necessarily is a is a is a perfect fit for a civilian type setup. But uh, like I mentioned, there are uh, lots of survival kits on the market today, and a lot of them include seer type components. Um, so that's where we sort of start to see the birth of this seer restraint escape style kits for the civilian sector. Now, here's where they fall short. A lot of these um, seer kits are container based. They are uh, they either have a plastic container or a metal like Suma container, uh, like on the previous slide. Um, they are, they're going to have some kind of physical container. All the little bits and bobs are put in this one container, and that's your seer kit, right? Well, you know, what if, you know, this is not really a, a sort of, you know, rabbit hole what if scenario. This is a very likely scenario. You're not going to have time to get to your kit. Um, if you're going to get, you know, snatched and grabbed off the street, you're not going to have time to take those items out of your kit and layer them on your body somewhere. You need to have that already pre-staged. So we find that a lot of times people are going to go out there and they're going to spend, you know, hundreds, hundreds of dollars uh, in, in some cases on these sear kits and they're just going to like put them in their pocket and go around like they're like they're perfectly fine. They can escape any situation. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, you know, these sear kits are, are, are great, and it's better to have one than to not have one. But 
let's be real when we're talking about the the adversaries we're going to be facing. We're simply going to be you know grabbed off the street, and we're not going to have a chance to um, implement our escape plan, right? You know, in the even worst case scenario, uh, what if you are uh, you know taken and uh, put in a uh, a situation where there is no sort of westernized um, standard of human living, right? Uh, you know, you're not going to have a lot of the tools that you think you might have, and you're going to have a lot more than you, you know, you didn't think you would have as well. So the situation can be highly dependent on where you're at. So like this image shows uh, an ISIS prison in, I believe, Syria um, at the time. Uh, my, my, I think it was right there in the Merv uh, on the uh, uh, Iraq-Syria border. But uh, the point is, is that we sort of have a romanticized view a lot of times of what Sear is going to look like and what a restraint escape situation is going to look like, and it might not live up to your, you know, expectations. So we need to 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 take some considerations uh, when it comes to actually the what the stuff we actually use, you know, is right. So. This is why we came up with this sort of system. We have conventional survival kits, right, that are built for survival. Like Solcoa is a company out there that's at, right at the cutting edge of if you're going to buy a pre made survival kit, you know, Solcoa makes the best ones. They're the ones who won the, the solicitation for the original stuff, and they've just been doing great stuff with all their civilian kits. So if you buy one of their pre made survival kits, you'll be pretty, you'll be sitting pretty, right? Uh, and then there's also dedicated SEER kits that don't have quite so many survival components, but they are dedicated for restraint escape and things like that. Well, we wanted to kind of merge the two and, and, and not necessarily create just one big kit that's both a survival kit and a SEER kit. We wanted to incorporate both sort of ideologies into the same thing, uh, the same system, right? We're not talking container-based. We're not talking... Like, uh, you know, uh, gear based. We're talking a, a, a sort of survival escape system, really, is what we're, is what we're looking at. And that's how we're kind of approaching it. So really, um, we're looking at not just one container, but multiple containers. Like, you know, it's the layer throughout our body, you know, so that if we have, you know, all of these components together, we'll be most prepared. But if we can't necessarily take our survival kit with us, but we can take our seer kit, we'll still be sort of okay. You know, we'll be able to, to make do. And then we have a lot of specialized gear that not very many people are talking about when it comes to even seer kits. A lot of people don't necessarily uh, think about some of the things that we're going to talk about here in this, which is probably going to be a very long video. Um, but yeah, that's why our, our main sort of system is we have a survival kit component um, with with some sear tools in it, so we have some bare bones stuff in it with that. Then we have a sort of sear capsule um, sort of mentality, which has some survival tools in it as well. So a little bit of each in each kit, so that you can uh, function both uh, both ways. And then we have sort of escape aids, which are not in any container, but they are layered on our person in various spots, um, you know, concealed on our body somehow. That we're and this is a daily thing. Uh, so that we're not necessarily relying on the ability to layer these items uh, from our seer kit on our person. You know, if we get yanked out of bed in the middle of the night, we'll still have stuff on us. That's that. That's the mentality with it. And then finally, of course, the most important part by far is the knowledge part. The knowledge part is most is the most important because not only is it the hardest to find, but it is also the hardest to learn. Um, very few uh, places and 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 sort of government entities are. Are going to talk about SEER. You know, the SEER courses that the military has are, of course, classified. And even some of the tactics that are in those classes are classified. So, you know, nobody can talk about them, really. A lot of the technology itself is classified as well. So we're, we don't exactly, we're not exactly dealing with an open source um, sort of system here. You know, we're not, you, the culture is not open source when it comes to SEER, even from SEER from other countries. Like, good luck finding any data whatsoever on Russian SEER courses. And we know they exist. Um, we know that, you know, from our professional atmosphere that they do exist. We just, you know, in the civilian sector, you're going to, you're not going to find any information on them at all. Um, so that's something to, to consider is moving forward is that the knowledge part is most important, but it's also going to be the most hard to find. 
So when it comes to most SEER kit uh, contents, you know, like I said before, we, we don't necessarily think that SEER is a good mentality from, or SEER as a concept isn't necessarily a good lens from which to view this in a civilian capacity. It's not a perfect fit, uh, but the tools are. So you're going to see, you can Google, you know, buy SEER kit or something like that, and you're going to find a bunch of different ones from a bunch of different companies. And most of the time, they're going to have these four things inside them. First of all, you're going to have restraint escape tools. Next up, you're going to have containment escape tools. So once you get out of your hand restraints, you're going to have to get out of your cell or container that you're in somehow. And third up is barter slash trade components. Now, a lot of times these, this doesn't exist in a lot of commercial seer kits. Um, I can't think of any actually that have bartering tools in them, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And then lastly, survival components, things like ferro rods, uh, you know, fire starters, things like that. You know, those are, are, are quite common to put in kits because they're quite cheap and very small to, to put in there. Um, so that's what most seer kits have. And that's kind of the roughly the, the, the categories from which we approach um, the, the sort of seer kit concept, right? So let's go through each of these categories and let's talk about some of the specific tools that we keep in our SEER kit specifically. Now first up is restraint escape. So handcuff keys, like we mentioned before, absolutely crucial. There's two main kinds that we personally use. Um, there are many out there. But these two are the, are the really the two big ones. The one on the left is the tiny inconspicuous handcuff key, and the one on the right is the uh, the delta key. Um, the one on the left, uh, the the tiny inconspicuous handcuff key, really the only selling well, there's two sell selling points for it. One, it has a it has a clip on it, and that allows it to be clipped into things like underwear, t-shirts, in the rolls of fabric, all, all kinds of in, in your sock, and you'll never know it. That's a huge selling feature that not many handcuff keys have, because the attachment point is really the crucial part. You know, you can have uh, you know 50 different handcuff keys on you, but if you have to sew them into your clothing every time, that gets tedious, and you're not going to do it. Um, unless you leave them permanently sewn in your clothes, um, but then you have to buy an awful lot of handcuff keys. Whereas this one, you could buy three or four of these and just clip them in your t-shirt, clip them in your underwear as you go about the day and, you know, just continuously, you know, when you take your clothes off, you know, and, and change clothes, just move the key over to a new uh, set of garments. And that works quite well and it's pretty cheap to do. The other handcuff key is the Delta key, and for obvious reasons, uh, it's preferred uh, in some areas because it works on a lot more cuffs than the uh, than the plastic one. Uh, however, it's also metal. Um, now, granted, it is titanium, so it is very metal detector resistant, but it's not completely irresistible to metal detectors, whereas a plastic key is. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, we keep both. Uh, we use one. We have uh, one or two of each in uh, the little survival capsules that we use. Um, but yeah, it's just something to keep in mind is that if you're trying to go for a zero metal content, that's you know the Delta key is is kind of it's going to have to go out. And then uh, another type of key, which we have not seen anyone at all talk about, is the um, the, the sort of uh, Anhua, if that's how it's pronounced, Anhua cuffs uh, from Oscar uh, Oscar Delta. They may, Oscar Delta is, a, I believe, a British company that makes these keys. And these keys are the only ones on the market that work for the Chinese police handcuffs. Now, we had, of course, planned to show these handcuffs in, you know, part three, um, but that's going to have to come later. Later. So we'll show you how uh, these handcuffs work specifically, but it, the short version is you can't use a normal American handcuff key on them. You have to use this tube-like thing because the key is actually has to be a tri hollow triangle shape. Now, so these uh, handcuffs are obviously the only thing on the market that work for these handcuffs. So you're, if you're in you know Southeast Asia, most Southeast Asian nations use these handcuffs, and a lot of Middle Eastern nations use these handcuffs as well. And you cannot shim them. The only way to get out of them is using this type of key. Now that being said, you know Oscar Delta is, is is doing a great thing by offering this. They're the only company that offers it so far. But keep in mind is that their keys aren't quite perfect. So if, um, as you can see here on this image, the key on the left has been used one time, and the key on the right in this image has been used not at all. And as you can see, the one on the left is rounded out quite significantly. 
And that's because the turning force, the torque needed to, to actually open these Chinese police handcuffs is quite significant. It is double or triple the amount of effort required to turn the key on an American style set of handcuffs. And that's important because the key is made out of copper. This uh, Delta, uh, you know, Oscar Delta uh, Anhua key is made out of copper. And it's basically a one time use tool. And in some cases, like these two keys here that I have, that I'm showing you right now, um, they didn't ever open the handcuffs. So, uh, as you can see on the image on the right, where the three keys there on the on the coin, the one on the left, we took a pair of pliers and bent it into more of a triangle shape, and those work fine. Uh, those work a lot better than it, you know just crimping it just a little bit into more of a triangle permanent tr triangle shape. Uh, that works out quite well on these uh, Chinese police handcuffs. So if you buy these and put them in your kit, just recognize that you're going to have to do that because these keys, as they come from Oscar Delta, some of them work, some of them don't. Some of them work flawlessly on, on certain Chinese handcuffs. But the as we, you know, as we were going to talk about in the uh, video on, about these specific handcuffs, their uh, machining tolerances vary widely. Like some of these handcuffs, like we have a pair of these handcuffs that the key that comes with the handcuffs cannot open. <laughs> like that's how bad these are manufactured. And so if you're trying to uh, cover the most tolerances, the, the, the most different kinds of, of these Chinese police handcuffs, you're going to have to adapt your keys um, to do that. So that's just kind of an aside. Uh, you know, we wanted to talk about this in a different video, of course, but um, that's going to come out a little bit later. But yeah, a, a, a dedicated key for Chinese police handcuffs is crucial if you spend a lot of time in those areas. Not so much a concern for America, but um, these are used widely around the world. And then up next is, of course, the um, the, the ubiquitous uh, handcuff key shim. Now, this is just an example, one that we have sort of. It's the key style uh, handcuff shim, where it's got a little bit of a, a little bit of a grip to it, and we bent it so that it can fit in uh, in, in a kit a little bit better. You know, you can buy these, you can use these, um, uh, you can use the split Paul kind or the Russian kind, depending on where you were taught. Um, they, uh, the, those work as well. Uh, actually, those are the ones I use in my own personal kit, but this is just an example of handcuff shim or, or handcuff shims are quite crucial. Um, especially if you are, you know, sort of, uh, using up against a blue box type system. It's really the only thing that's going to work, you know, it, you know, if you can take advantage of the fact that nobody can, you know, double lock the cuffs, right? So, uh, take a look at, um, parts one and two for talking about more about shims, but yeah, shims go in the kit. Um, also, um, extra Kevlar cordage. Now I have this as an example, a size reference next to this, uh, sort of crushed up dollar bill and Kevlar cordage is a great escape tool. Now you can put this in your kit. You can also sew it into your clothing very loosely so that you could just pull it out. Like I've got it on uh, a couple of pairs of pants. I've just got it, you know, wrapped around the inside of the waistband so that I can reach around behind and pull it out from inside the, the pants. It's just like pulling a, you know, the thread loose on a sweater, but instead of pulling the pants loose, it pulls the Kevlar cord out. So that's a good way to do that as well. If you didn't want to store it in the kit. Um, and then up next is something that not a whole lot of people, well, a lot of people talk about the normal ceramic razor blades, but you can also buy uh, ceramic razor blades are becoming very, very commercially popular. And this company called Slice um, makes like holiday gift wrapping, um, you know, cutting tools and things like they're a craft company. And they make a great uh, escape innovation tool, um, which is basically their version of an X Acto knife, but it's all plastic. Now, it must be noted that on the inside of where this razor blade is held in, it's held in by a metal spring, but you can, you can pull that out quite easily and make this entirely plastic. And this is great because a lot of people you're used to buying these little six dollar uh, ceramic razor blades with little hole in them and things like that and those are those are good those work but why not have a why not have a tool with a handle on it because a tool with a handle on it uh, can fit inside the small survival capsule we're going to talk about in a minute and it it greatly greatly expands your capability so that's something to, to keep in mind and it can also function as an improvised uh, improvised defensive tool um, if, if need be um, has a cap on it and things like that so 
that is a great tool um, to use if you're in if you're uh, looking to get into it. It's expensive. Um, it's quite expensive. The razor blades are uh, roughly double what uh, normal razor blades, uh, normal ceramic razor blades cost. Um, and I think the whole tool itself is like, gosh, I hate to quote a price on film that's going to change. It's a, you can get anywhere from fifteen to thirty bucks one of these um, uh, razor blade tool exacto knife things, and it comes with a couple of blades. Uh, so depending on where you get it from. So yeah, that's that's something to, to look into. Ceramic razor blades, non-metallic, absolutely uh, crucial for a kit like this. And then up next are lock picks. Now, uh, these are the absolute smallest lock picks that I would consider using. And these are the, the Bogota, I think, Nano. I think that's what they're called. Uh, we have a few, the minis, the micros, or whatever they're called. And we have all different sizes of these Bogotas. They're expensive. They're very expensive uh, tools, but they are titanium. They're low. Um, they're they're not made of a ferrous metal, which means they're harder to harder to detect with a metal detector. Once again, um, and so yeah, that's why they go in our kit because these are the smallest ones that we can use um, physically. Right? There are smaller ones out there, smaller uh, lock picks, but they are made of steel, uh, which is you know quite magnetic and uh, very easily detectable via a metal detector and they also um, don't quite have the capabilities these have so um, you know this is about as small as we go with the, with the lock picks and they fit easily in the survival type capsule and then up next is something that not very many people talk about because it's kind of expensive is an escape saw. Now this particular escape saw I think we got from Shomer Tech, but there's now a couple of different brands out there. Um, and they we had put the price here on the screen as 20 bucks because that's I think what the MSRP is, but we got this one for $8. Um, I can't remember from where. I think it was Shomer Tech, but I'm not entirely certain. And we got a few of these. And this saw is like you 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 don't quite understand how sharp it is until you get it. And I I've never seen a saw like this before. Not even like a small like jeweler's little saw. Um, this kind of saw is amazing. It will cut through everything. Um, so this saw is worth way more than its weight in gold. Um, and I would highly recommend getting one of these little escape saws like this. And also it functions as a handcuff shim. It's the right size to work as that. And it's long, so it will work on a lot of those uh, handcuffs that, uh, like we showed before, those rigid cuffs where it has a re you need a really long shim to get in there and bypass those locking poles. Uh, this one will work. Uh, it will work quite well, in fact. Um, and the saw blade doesn't get in the way when it's used as a handcuff shim. So this is one of those tools where it's like you're hesitant to buy it because it's like, ah, that's kind of expensive for such you know a tiny little saw blade. There's better saw blades out there, right? Um, but we pulled the trigger on it. We bought it, and we bought a few of these, and they have been amazing. I would not hesitate to buy uh, quite a few more of these. So that's the sort you and um, this saw blade goes by a few different names. Um, uh, but you can generally just Google escape saw and you'll find it. Uh, it's a very small little saw blade like that. Then up next are uh, a couple of more, you know, more like containment escape tools, like for padlocks. So we've got a quick stick and an easy decoder. Uh, once again, they're bent to sort of fit the round container. You can leave these in or you can take them out. Um, I personally don't uh, rely on these. I take them out because they're... Um, they're steel, uh, spring steel, and it. Uh, I'm trying to get. I personally, my personal one is trying to be as 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 have as little magnetic signature as possible. Um, and these really don't grant me a whole a uh, whole heck of a lot of capability, considering I have a saw blade, I have you know lock picks themselves, things like that. I can get. I can fashion a way to get through a padlock um, without using this type of tool. So. Um, put them in if you want. I think a few guys have them in theirs here. Um, but yeah, it's something to consider. These are a fairly common component in a lot of sear kits. And then up next is barter slash trade items. Now this is one where we kind of wanted to explain what we're talking about here because a lot of people get bent out of shape when it comes to talking barter goods. Now, 
I will admit that bartering in a seer type scenario is probably not a good idea. Um, it's not a super great thing. Um, it, usually, most seer doctrine, like anybody who's been through a normal seer, seer course, will tell you, yeah, bartering is it, that went out of the window. You know, back in the fifties, right? We don't barter anymore. We avoid civilians as much as possible, and because usually a civilian population means we're going to get turned in. You know, the United States military learned that very well from Vietnam. Um, and subsequent conflicts uh, throughout the Middle East is that basically yeah, you're not going to have a population that is uh, on your side. This isn't World War II anymore. The world has changed quite significantly. Now, that being said, we also have to remember, though, that in the civilian sector, we might have that option. You know, we are not, you know, like downed aviators, you know, where most SEER courses are, you know, um, meant to sort of portray we're civilians right we, we're in our own communities so uh, bartering might be an option if nothing else we're talking about like bribing guards and things like that and that might be a, a better option and gold is very very small it's very lightweight if you keep a gram or two on you um, and it, it it's relatively cheap for what you can get out of it. See, these little one gram bars are very, very small. You can see how they fit there, but two of them fit on a quarter. And you can fit these very easily pretty much anywhere. Um, and they have a lot of value. So um, you can use them to easily trade. You know, the, the, the uses for these are quite literally endless in a civilian seer type scenario. Not so much useful in a, a conventional military uh, sense, but we do have to remember the origins, right? These did exist in the military sort of history, right? There were such things as barter kits, as you can see here on the slide. Um, it, you know, aviators throughout the Pacific and in some parts of the European theaters, mostly the Pacific theaters as far as we know, um, but comment below if you know where these were used uh, more often. These barter kits are sort of a lesser known part of history where they are a kit of, of valuable things that could be used with a native population to help get a downed aviator to back to American friendly lines, right? So this one on the right here contains a very nice uh, mechanical watch with a little watch band. You know, watches aren't typically that hugely valuable to, you know, a westernized society, but to, you know, a, a sort of Pacific Islander culture back in the 40s, they, you know, a very you know, um, very tribal like culture, a timepiece might have a lot more value than a gold coin would. Um, you know, likewise, a lot of these, you know, small shiny baubles and things like that, going back to the, you know, quasi offensive, you know, era of, of, um, you know, colonists, you know, trading with, you know, uh, Native Americans and things like that. They weren't trading things that had particular value, um, to the, to the, you know, the Westerners, but to the natives, they had great value. So things like that, you know, a little copper or, or, uh, you know, so, you know, very low carat uh, gold, um, very ill-fitting uh, pressed, you know, rings, things like that might have great value. And that's where sort of where we're coming from. Now, in a modern day society, we, of course, are going to use these little gram pieces, uh, little gram uh, bars of gold um, because they're easier to carry and, you know, things like that. But, you know, just keep in mind is that bartering, while it has come out of the, the doctrine for most of um, you know American societies, it might be willing to put in. It might be worth putting in your seer kit, um, just on your you know out of your own consideration. So, um, just think about that. It's something to think about. You don't have to do any of the stuff we're saying, of course. But it's you know a lot of people um, put down bartering, or and a lot of people, of course, overestimate the power of bartering. Like they're going to be able to walk up to a guard and say, "I'd like to be let out of jail, please. Here's one one gram of gold." Like, no, it's not going to work like that. But in a situation where you might have the opportunity to barter, you want to have something to barter with. So that's why we include gold. Now, another barter tool that we use is uh, diamonds. Now, diamonds historically have been quite bad for currency. Um, they have very little resale value. Um, they uh, they cannot be divided easily like gold can, and they are very very uh, different. Every single diamond is different, which means that it basically checks all the uh, you know checks all the boxes for not becoming a currency. Um, so diamonds are not um, a great SHTF's currency. Um, it would not be a good idea to stockpile diamonds or anything like that. Now that being said, 
We do include one diamond, uh, one little 0.23 uh, carat diamond in these kits because as you see, look how small it is. It is so small and it cost us around 250 bucks to buy it from a, a certified American vendor. Now, if you've ever been to a foreign country like Afghanistan and you try to buy some of the jewelry that's, you know, on base or, um, uh, you know, come, the stuff that comes through the Kyber Pass and stuff like that. Um, you can get uh, non-certified, almost certainly illegal diamonds for a lot cheaper, and um, that would probably be you know an option for some people if you're not too concerned about you know U.S. laws. You know, if obviously if you're in the U.S., you have to obey U.S. laws, and you know those kinds of diamonds are illegal. But if you're in Afghanistan, if you're in a country that doesn't necessarily care about the diamond trade. Um, that might be an option for you, and you can get it for a lot cheaper. You buy a two-carat diamond for like what, fifty bucks or something like that, you know, off some kid in a foreign country, and uh, it'll be a perfectly fine, you know, perfectly fine diamond. Of course, it's you know morally questionable, but you know that's just how the diamond trade works in other countries. Um, and we might have a future video talking about that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, sorry, we're gonna have to leave it kind of vague for now, but. The point is, is that diamonds can uh, be, serve as a last-ditch currency, um, and that's because a lot of, like I mentioned, a lot of terror groups use diamonds to finance their terrorism. To this day, even though they're not a good currency, they don't necessarily have a whole lot of resale value. They're very hard to tell what value they have. Um, you'd need a very special. You'd have to know what you're looking at to tell how valuable a diamond is. And even then, it you know it might mean something to some. You could have two you know diamond. Uh, you know you could have two jewelers look at the same diamond and give you a different price for it. So that's not a that's you know basically rules it out as a currency, unless you're dealing with like a terror group or something. So if you're held you know if you're held captive by a terror group or if you've you know you've got a uh, you know, pay your way through a you know a dirty guard or some kind of border checkpoint in a foreign nation, which we may or may not have had to do many times in the past. Um, diamonds work. Diamonds work quite well. So, uh, keeping one around, you see how small it is. It doesn't hurt anything. It takes up no space in your kit. And um, if you can do that, you know, it would not be a, a bad thing to do. And then moving on to a more conventional barter thing you can just keep cash on you like um uh we have this uh um dollar bill here uh which is a 50 dollar bill a 50 american dollar bill and then we also have a 50 euro note that can, we can cram up and uh shove in um our kit so that works out quite well um you can use you know spend money no matter where so euros obviously europe um you're not going to find any place in the united states that takes euros um but that's so that's why we have the american dollar bill and the american dollar bill functions in a lot of it works in most countries on earth i haven't i don't think i've ever been to a country that did not accept american dollars at some place now a lot of places of course within europe don't accept uh, american dollars um in the countries but you can always find some place that does i haven't been to anywhere where you have to use Amer you have to use the local currency with the exception of uh, places like war zones where um the local population does not want to get caught with american currency because um that mean that they might get labeled as a collaborator with Americans, right? So, like in a lot of places in you know Iraq and Syria, you're not going to find you're going to find that uh, the locals don't want to take American cash; they want to take their local currency or something else in trade because they don't want to get caught with the American dollar bills. At least that's the way it was a you know a few years ago. Um, but yeah, keeping cash on you in your little survival cat capsule is very very important. And then up next is sort of the sort of survival components. And the first one up is this little thumbtack compass. Um, compasses like this are quite amazing. I think the very first uh, first time that we heard about this was a little NATO 40 millimeter compass, a little dry cell compass um, that I think they're still made nowadays. Um, but they work quite well. These are, I think, thumbtack. They're labeled as thumbtack compasses from uh, County Com. It's the only place I've been able to find them. Uh, but they are very, very small, as you can see by how small it is compared to that quarter. 
and they fit very well inside the lid of the survival capsules or uh, if you don't want to glue them to the inside of the lid uh, you can just stick them in there um, they also fit very well in little you know pico containers as we'll talk about in a minute um, but yeah these these compasses work quite well i will note though that somehow or another we've got like i don't know 15 or 20 of these laying around and so at some point in time uh, they become demagnetized. Now, some of this only happens with a, uh, with a couple of the ones we have. Like they they no longer point north, and I don't know how or why, but it's just kind of a reminder that if you're dealing with something this small and it's a dry cell, you might want to um, might want to keep checking it every now and then to make sure that it actually does in fact point north and you haven't demagnetized it in some way because the needle is so small. Um, and you know, so yeah, that's something to keep in mind. And then up next, this is something that I, we know we don't really see a whole lot of people talking about, um, but water treatment tablets in a survival capsule. Um, and this is something that you, like our personal experience sort of came out, and I'll show you an image. And this image was from uh, Nepal uh, when uh, we were there uh, a while ago. And this image is taken from about 300 kilometers from the nearest town. So this road is the only part of the road that goes through this part of the country. Um, it's down um, a little bit further south to, than uh, Kathmandu, uh, the, main, the, the capital there. And it's in the middle of nowhere. Um, quite literally, there is nothing uh, except for this road. Um, there's no humans, there's no villages, there's there's nothing in this particular part of the country for you know a couple hundred kilometers around. And there's garbage everywhere. There is trash everywhere. You would be surprised um, at how much garbage is in places around the world that like where no humans should be or go. Like I remember going to um, going to Indonesia and just going to the beaches there and just walking the beaches and you cannot take a single step without stepping on some plastic garbage. So suffice it to say, the world today in 2020 is polluted. It's polluted as heck, and it is not a um, place that I want to drink water from. You know, this is not the kind of thing where you can go back and um, look at, you know, survival guides and survival manuals from like 50 years ago and say like, oh, you know, you can drink water that's clean coming out of a mountain or things like that. You know, that's really, it's really going to be hard to find a, a spot of water on planet Earth that has not been contaminated by human beings, even in some of the most remote areas on the planet. So that's why we wanted to carry water treatment because water treatment um, tablets can prevent you from getting very, very sick. And if you're on the run and you get some kind of thing like Giardia or, you know, crypto or something like that, uh, you could quite literally be dead within a couple of days. Um, if, if nothing else, you're going to be sapped of all energy uh, within within 24 hours, and that's not good. And if you're in some kind of you know escape and evasion scenario, right? So that's why we talk about water treatment tablets, and we keep them on us um, no matter what. Now these are the um, uh, uh, potable aqua tablets. No, they're the micro, they're the catered in micro pure tablets. Um, there are some other ones called uh, from Israel called called uh, Taharmayim, I think is how you say it. Uh, you'll notice the packaging has you know Hebrew lettering all over it. Um, when you Google like uh, water purification tablets, they are a lot smaller and they might fit in these survival capsules a little bit more. But these were micro pure tablets that we had, um, and we just you know shoved them in there because it it uh, took up a little bit of extra space and prevented the the kit from rattling so much. So. Um, that uh, that's why we have those in our kit. All right, and up next is something that I don't I haven't seen anybody talk about at all, and this is a, a micro SD card. Now, this is one of those things where we're going to have to be kind of cryptic again about why we have it. Um, but we we always all of us here um, separately and independently carry a micro SD card. And, you know, sometimes multiple ones. Um, and on that micro SD card, we have three partitions. So the first partition is unencrypted. It is just a normal, you plug it into a USB adapter, plug it into a computer, you can read it normally. And that thing, and that um, uh, that partition has our identity documents, you know, scans of passports, driver's licenses, things like that, you know, visas, you know, entry paperwork. Um, uh, if you're traveling in a country that requires it, a lot of times, you know, vaccine paperwork, things like that. Uh, medical records if you know if we get injured and you know we're unconscious somebody finds this you know capsule on our person they plug in this micro SD card they can get our medical records and things like that if they need them um, we also have on there a sort of information arc uh, you know like we've mentioned before 
um, uh, sort of like a you know like a Noah's Ark of information, you know, information that's likely to be banned. So you know, a couple hundred survival manuals, you know, all kinds of things that are um, likely to not be available in a lot of places. So we keep that you know on the unencrypted part because so it's easier to get to. So on part two, I'm afraid we're going to have to be you know even more cryptic about that. Um, part two is going to also be encrypted, and it is going to have a negotiating tool, a small bit of information that we can give people the password to. We could tell them the password uh, to allow them to install the encryption software and decrypt partition two. Uh, and that can serve to verify our identity if we needed to. Um, we don't want that unencrypted because we want people to have to interact with us at some point in time. So say we get picked up for something and we need to verify our authenticity, but we can't, we don't want to have it on an unencrypted drive. Um, we could physically tell our captors slash interrogators, right? Okay, open partition two on the hard drive. Here's the password for it. That should verify our identity or it could be used to barter. So we could say, hey, this is the information we have. Um, if you want to talk about negotiating for our freedom, we can do that too. And then partition three is essentially our insurance policy. It is um, an, another partition where we can have a whole host of information that might be valuable to any government agency on earth. And um, if, you know, part two, partition two can serve to verify the authenticity, verify who we are, verify that we do have the access to the information that we do have. And part three is the um, is the full on sort of um, uh, information that can be used to uh, ensure our freedom or if nothing else, it can be used to um, ensure our, our authenticity. Right. So. Uh, that's that's sort of what we keep on the micro SD cards. Uh, hopefully, people out there who are in the know, um, who might need this sort of setup, will recognize what we're talking about because every analyst out there has an insurance policy. Um, once you've seen enough stuff out there to make sure that you, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of times Intel analysts and people, not necessarily analysts, this is more of an ops thing, but people who get involved in special programs or things like that. Um, oftentimes realize that in order to make it home uh, in one piece, they need some kind of insurance policy to make sure that their government comes and gets them and doesn't just leave, you know, drop them like third period France, right? Um, so, you know, incidents have happened over time and, um, you know, I'm just going to leave it at that. So micro SD cards uh, are very, um, very, very important, especially when it comes to information. And then sort of along those lines is a more thing that we can talk a little bit more freely about is, is a blood shit. Now, this is something that is more of a governance, government thing only, but you can make your own. And essentially a blood shit, you can you know, read about it on your own. It's fascinating to read the history of these. But essentially what it is, it's a document. It's a document that has one statement on it or a series of statements. And it is written in um, most languages on Earth, most common languages. Uh, certainly the, the languages in a specific area. So if you're operating in, say, like Southeast Asia, every language spoken in Southeast Asia will be on this bloodshed. And essentially it's a document that says, hey, I'm an American. I'm in trouble. Uh, if you help if you help me, my government will pay you a certain dollar amount. And, um, yeah, help, you know, help me get back here. Take this, take, you know, rip off a corner of the document. That's your receipt, essentially, that you helped me. And you can go to the embassy and claim your reward, right? Um, these were very popular in World War II. They came out, they arose actually out of the very first bloodshed, I believe, was uh, from a, a balloonist in France from like the 17th century or 18th century, something like that. Don't quote me on that. But uh, this, this concept of a bloodshed goes back hundreds of years. Um, quite a long way, uh, really to the very first time, uh, you know, the very first air travel with balloons is how far back they go. And they're still used today, although nowadays they look more like this. This is what bloodshits look like uh, in today's modern military. They're mostly the same piece of paper, you know, durable Tyvek paper, um, but they are uh, put in belts. Um, so they call, they're called blood shit belts nowadays. Now, of course, we can't show what one like looks like for real um, because, you know, there aren't any pictures of that on the Internet and they are heavily serialized. 
Um, so you, you sign these out. These are controlled items. You sign these out just in the military when you're issued one. You sign these out just like you sign on a pair of night vision goggles or a weapon. Uh, it's cataloged because it has currency value. Uh, each corner of that document is worth $10,000, I think is the going rate. Um, so if that gets into the wrong hands, you could potentially be paying terrorists up to $40,000 um, if hard American dollars, no question, is asked. So that's why these are kind of a sort of a not really a taboo item to talk about. It's just no, nobody really knows about them. So if you wanted to make your own, um, you can. I would advise doing this. Actually, it'd be quite good, quite good to have. You know, put it on some Tyvek paper, print it out on some really durable, you know, paper, right in the rain paper or something like that, and you know, just keep it around. Um, because that's a, a really good part of a, of a survival kit, you know, so is a sort of blood shit. Now, obviously you can't really make one that is, you know, value, you know, uh, has value to it. Like, you know, tear this corner off and it's worth $10,000. That would be kind of not really doable. Uh, but you can write on a piece of paper in a bunch of different languages, a, you know, a phrase like, please help me get back to the nearest, you know, American embassy or something like that. And that would be good. You know, that's what we do a lot of times. Um, so yeah, blood chits are very, very useful. And then, so the next concept is, is switching gears quite, quite radically here. Um, this is the next concept we, that we wanted to talk about because it has more of a pop culture reference than anything. And uh, so this is also, by the way, the part where you know we're, we're going to be talking about some kind of adult uh, topics. So if you've got you know kids around listening to this, you might want to hit pause for a second or skip past it. Um, not to say you know we're you know going to get particularly vulgar. It's just you know this type of stuff is not quite pleasant or for mixed company. And this is the idea of the plan de evasion. Uh, plan of you know evasion or plan uh, simply, and this comes from a movie um, because people remember movies more than they remember U.S. classified documents, right? This comes from a movie called Papillon, uh, Steve McQueen movie from you know way back in the day. Oh, really good movie. Um, they did a remake of it here recently, but the original is of course always always better. But there's one particular scene right at the beginning of the movie where Steve McQueen's character is he's got this little capsule in his hand. And for those of you who don't know, you know, without spoiling the content of the movie, uh, the movie's about a guy who is sent to um, Devil's Island, um, and he is basically the worst prison in the world, and, and for a crime he didn't commit, of course, right? And this it's about documenting his journey to escape and things like that. So that's the plot of the movie if you haven't seen it before, but. Suffice it to say, very harsh conditions, right? And the only possessions he has in his, in his possession are in this little capsule. And the movie sort of explains it to try to explain to a, a civilian uh, audience what is exactly going on because it's a key part of the movie. And um, Steve McQueen's character is this kind of an expositional moment within the movie. Uh, he's being observed by a, a fellow inmate in, in a hammock on board the, the, the transport ship. And he's observed um, putting money in this little survival capsule, right? And he, and he remarks, you know, uh, as he's putting the money into the capsule, um, he makes a remark of, you know, oh, you know, the things we have to do, you know, for survival, you know, um, shoving things up one's uh, rear end, right? So it's a sort of rectal capsule um, that he keeps money in. And as most people know, this is very much a, a thing in U.S. prisons today. So um, skipping out of the fantasy land, because we don't want to ever do anything survival related, you know, based on a movie, right? This actually is a real thing. Um, in fact, this is an example, a 3D model uh, of a of the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, developed this what they quite literally called a rectal toolkit, and it is a metal capsule that has all a bunch of these little tools and stuff in it uh, for escaping and evading, and a little handle for all these tools as well. And uh, it, it's quite big. If you look at the uh, look at how big the capsule is, um, it's quite significantly, uh, quite quite large. In fact. Um, much larger than I think anyone would would want, <laughs> um, to put it delicately. Uh, but it's also press fit together. There's no threads in it at all. It's press fit together, and it's meant to, you know, uh, go right up inside a person and uh, for retrieval later, so that you could pass a strip search. And so that if you're in captivity, you could still have access to some tools. Now, the, uh, the, the British, our friends from across the pond, are not to be outdone. They have their own version as well. Uh, this is a more, more modern version um, from our, our friends over at MI6. 
um, they created one as well, and this is the only photo we could find of one. And it uh, is we don't know how big it is, um, but as you can see, the knurled surface there has got to be sort of painful, um, you know, going in and coming out from its hiding place. Um, but yeah, so this is a this is a real thing. This is not something that that's just you know in movies or whatnot. And then we also have to remember the prison example. Everyone knows about the you know the old. Um, to put it crudely, the prison pocket, right, that everybody uh, knows about. So this is the modern day version. Uh, this is a very mysterious product that appeared on Shomer Tech's website uh, a few years ago. And it's... Um, it has a quite obvious usage. Now, as you can see, one is quite tapered. There's no um, hard surfaces anywhere on it. There's no, um, you know, jagged surfaces. And uh, it looks like it has one very specific use. Now, the Shimmer Tech capsule is very, very interesting because it sort of unscrews in the middle right there. It has an O-ring on it so it's waterproof um, so the con contents inside don't get soiled. And... Um, Sometimes you'll find these being sold with a packet of uh, lubricating jelly right there. So there's really only one one possible usage for this uh, capsule. And the capsule itself is interesting because it's made out of magnesium. It's not made out of normal uh, metal. It's made out of magnesium so that if you had a ceramic razor blade on the inside of that capsule, you could shave. The capsule itself is a fire starting tool, which is interesting. Um, it's a great concept. Um, there are a few, you know, a few cons to it, though. Um, but yeah, the Shimmer Tech capsule is quite interesting. Now, one thing that um, we we must talk about is uh, this is the you know like I mentioned the the very crude term the you know prison pocket right. Um, this is something that modern day corrections um, is very much prepared for. People have been shoving things you know up their rear end for quite literally forever, as long as prisons have been around. So they've gotten quite good at detecting that sort of stuff. Now this is where uh, you know the sort of non-magnetic stuff comes into. This is the boss too. This is what most county. Uh, what uh, pretty much every corrections department in the world, or at least in the United States and Europe, uh, they have these. And these are designed to detect all kinds of metal inside a person, right? So if you swallowed something that's metal, it can detect it via the sensor on your back. Um, you should, basically, it's a metal detect that you sit on, and it can detect you know, all kinds of metal, you know, up inside your sort of intestinal cavity and things like that. So, um, that's why these, you know, old school tools won't necessarily work, and that's why the Schumer, you know, magnesium is uh, not as ferrous as steel. It's about like titanium, actually, um, but uh, magnesium does break down over time. Uh, it does weather and uh, things like that. So if you're wanting a capsule, we would recommend one that is plastic. Uh, entirely plastic. If Schumer Tech were to make one out of Delrin that was that exact shape and size, that would fit the bill, and we would buy a whole you know pallet load of them. Um, but yeah, it does it does weather quite significantly. The one I have here is um, starting to get a little bit of patina on it um, from being exposed to the elements uh, over over time and sweat and things like that. But um, yeah, so the, these metal capsules and metal tools inside the capsules, eh, you know, they, this is why. Um, you know, our when we're talking about civilian escape, it's really kind of ridiculous to think that you could get anything past a you know corrections type you know atmosphere. Um, sure, you know a person could swallow a plastic handcuff key, and no corrections department in the world would ever know it. There's no way you could ever detect that, um, except for maybe an X-ray and a sharp-eyed uh, X-ray technician. But at the same time, like if you get a handcuff case out of prison, what are you going to do with it? Like, you know, <laughs> most of the time you're going to be transported in handcuffs with, you know, using a, uh, a blue box or a black box. So it doesn't matter if you have a key or not. So that's just something to keep in mind is that these, you know, the tactics and tools we're talking about today cannot be really used in a correction style environment. But if your adversary does not have one of these detectors, you're golden. Um, another thing that has that has recently hit the market is from a company called Tracer Tactical, um, and these are uh, what they're calling tongue inserts. I think that's the latest product uh, name they've given these, and this is essentially a uh, basically a, a shoe a shoe tongue that you uh, it's a hollow cavity. It's velcroed on the top, and you can slip all of these tools inside it, put it back in your shoe, lace your shoe on top of it. 
and no one would ever know it's there. It's quite an interesting concept. Um, we haven't tested these specific ones out, but we have, um, before these became commercialized, we had privately and personally sewn our own versions of this. So I'm wondering uh, where they got the idea from, because I think I probably know. Um, but yeah, this, the, these, this company makes these, um, they're pretty cheap. Uh, you can get them and things like that. But once again, you know, if, if, you know, you're worried about, if people are worried, if corrections are worried out there about these sort of things, look, corrections departments already know about these. As soon as they hit the market, um, the Chicago police department issued an internal statement, um, warning officers about these. So every cop knows about these, but your adversary who's trying to kidnap you or take you hostage probably won't, um, because they don't have the infrastructure. So once again, that's, that's sort of why we're, we're talking about this. And then really these are the rest of our uh, sort of capsules. As you can see there, the sort of Shomer tech, um, a magnesium capsule in the middle, um, back in the back left corner, that's, um, a, uh, a Suma container from Solcoa. That's the larger container, the large size. Um, I prefer personally the small size um, because it's I'm able to fit uh, roughly the same amount of stuff in in mine. It's just crammed in there, and it's significantly smaller, so I can keep it in a pocket. It doesn't seem like if you look on the website, the large and the small Suma container, it does, they don't seem like they're that much of a difference. But trust me, if you're if once you get both of them in your hands, the smaller one is is significantly smaller and is a lot more pocketable in a more concealed fashion. Um, now, obviously, you know, like we mentioned before, Suma containers not necessarily the best for. Um, concealing things like that. So we personally use, most of us here use um, Delrin battery lockers, battery containers from Countycom. They're the only website that we have been able to find that has these. And um, the you know 18650 uh, size seems to be the best. Um, it's the biggest, of course, though. Uh, one guy here, as you can see in the image, one of our guys has the AA size, and he's you know, that works out fine for him. Um, it's a little smaller, uh, actually it's a little bit bigger diameter wise, but you can fit a little bit less in it than the um, Shomer Tech uh, magnesium capsule. Um, but yeah, once again, it's plastic and you know, you can, if you wish, um, put a little lanyard on it like the AA one does there, or you can sew like a little pocket with a uh, safety pin on it like we have there and just slip the, slip it in there and then dangle it down inside inside the front of your pants there so that it's um, it's, it's always on you, right? So that, that's how you can carry these capsules. There's a bunch of different ways. You can even use it, you know, in the top right corner we have a, you know, a normal travel wallet you know, for tourists and things like that, and a very touristy thing to have. But it's great for storing SEER gear and SEER equipment because it's flat if it's under your clothing, and it, um, it's got a, lot, a, a couple of good pockets in there to keep everything nice and flat. So that's, um, you know, choosing a container is the hardest part, but, you know, if we're pushed uh, to, to choose one, these um, 18650-sized uh, uh, Delrin battery lockers are the best because they can function as like a sort of plan de vision, right? Or the sort of um, papillon container, right? Because they're just, that's about the biggest you can use one of these for. And as you can see, we've sanded off the top on one of those to make it a little bit more smooth, just in case um, we have to do do the dirty deed, right? So um, I know it's not, very, it's not really pleasant to talk about, but if, if it comes down to it and, and you know, um, that's, that's what we're going to, going to do um, so yeah not a whole lot of people talk about that sort of thing that's why we wanted to bring it up is because it's actually quite a quite a significant thing it's one of those things that everybody thinks about but nobody talks about so we wanted to finally talk about it um, because we've been doing it for years and it's actually sort of kind of may or may not be making its way into a lot of official seer courses so um, you'll you'll uh, see that is, is a lot of um, some sometimes depending on the instructor but um, yeah so that that should help you out with your containers. Um, and then, like I said, you know, to sort of move forward, the this is a system, right? This is not just focusing on the gear, but so this is a system. And the first part of the system we have is our survival kit. So that's my personal one. Um, that's the, the the small Suma container. That's my survival kit. Now, there might be, a, if you guys are interested, uh, we're obviously not survival experts, but if you're interested, let us know, and we'll do a full video on the survival kit. 
um because that's going to take a while to go through um but yeah sumo container survival kit with a couple of you know maybe handcuff key or sham or something in there um and then next we have the survival capsule so yeah that's that's my survival capsule that i use um every single day and as you can see i have a little clip on it so then i could clip it to the very front of my belt or around a, a pant button and um let it dangle down in front of uh in front of my uh private area right and so because it's a little bit people are less hesitant to to grow up your groin area right even during a pat down people are far less they're looking they're feeling for a gun they're feeling for a knife they're not feeling for a tiny little capsule like that right so that's uh, something to keep in mind and then of course I have these tiny inconspicuous handcuff keys me personally um, I carry anywhere from three to four daily on pretty much every article of clothing I have um, I might seem a little bit paranoid, whatever, I don't care. It just makes it a lot easier because we do a lot of spot training around here sometimes where it's like, oh, okay, now you're going to, you're kidnapping me right now. Let's, okay, fine, let's do this. So it makes it a little easier to do that kind of stuff. So, and once you develop a habit, it's, you know, kind of hard to quit. Um, and then also I tend to carry most days in, you know, one of my back pockets, a, a dedicated lock pick set just because, you know, like I said, we do a lot of training around here, um, both at work and here, you know, privately, um, I spend me personally, I spend maybe 10 to 15 minutes a day, you know, practicing lock picking, um, just cause that's a skill I, I want to improve on some guys over here. You know, some guys here don't necessarily do it that much. Some, some guys do spend, you know, take like a whole Saturday and do it. Spend a whole whole day picking locks once a week or so, um, but I like to do it you know 10 15 minutes a day or so. So I keep that keep you know lock picks on me uh, a lot, and then also I tend to have you know, pretty much every item that has a zipper to include pants zippers. If there is a zipper that's on my clothing, it's got one of these tiny little pico pools from uh, County Com on it, and um, they these pico pools have two things in them and two things only. One is one of those thumbtack compasses um, that is. Uh, that is one of the items and the other item I can't show on camera because I'm not really sure what YouTube's policy is on it um, but I do have a prescription for um, uh, chemical uh, go substance so back in the day um, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, military survival kits from World War II you'll find had substance called dextroamphetamine, basically go pills, so that you're able to uh, take this pill and uh, stay awake for days. And ha you know, it's basically a you know a, a slightly less uh, uh, a slightly less harsh version of freaking you know meth. So the modern version of, of dextroamphetamine uh, is a substance called Adderall, which a lot of people uh, love and know. And uh, I personally do not like it at all. Um, but, you know, just like, you know, when I was in college, I remember pretty much everybody I knew was on Adderall at some point. Um because they were able to just, they were handing it out like candy at student, at the student health, you know, clinic. Um, but, uh, you know, once I realized, hey, you know, most sur military survival kits used to have dextroamphetamine in them, uh, you know, obviously you can't really get modern day meth, you know, <laughs> and put that in a survival kit. But we, you know, we have, you know, being sort of cryptic once again, sorry, uh, we have found out that a lot of times a lot of pilots are prescribed, you know, Adderall. Uh, and they, they don't take it regularly, but they do put it in, the, in their own personal survival kits. So we did the same. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say, it's it's like a, it's not necessarily a widespread doctrine, but it is what a lot of people do. And we have seen a lot of people do that. So um, it's like one of those you know, things, it's not really a secret, but it kind of is. Um, so you'll see a lot of people, you know, spe you know, especially on YouTube, they'll they'll talk about their survival kits and there'll be like an obviously empty spot. Well, that's because there was a, a, a prescription pill bottle in there for Adderall. Um, it's sort of like a go pill. So that's what I do. Um, I have a you know prescription for it. It's all legal, all 100% you know, above board and all that kind of stuff. I keep a copy of the prescription in my survival kit. Um, just in case you get held up at another, you know, another country, um, cause that happens a lot. So yeah, if you can't get your hands on Adderall, uh, like a couple of guys here haven't really bothered getting the prescription. Uh, they could, but they haven't bothered with it. Um, 
the uh, you can just use caffeine pills and that works out well. That's what I used for years before I realized, hey, um, you know, the the military medicine medical system will give you pretty much whatever you want. Um, so and they don't really care about it. So uh, yeah, that's that's something to consider is some kind of chemical tool to help keep you going in an extreme environment. So that's what I keep in the little pico pools. Um, and yeah, so another thing is you may have noticed, uh, some people probably have noticed in this very long video already, uh, the coin, the quarter that we have in the, uh, that we've used as a scale reference throughout this entire video is actually a tool as well. And this is a separate thing that we usually keep in our pocket with other pocket change. And this is not a normal quarter. This is actually a concealment quarter. If you turn it over and you look, you can actually see along the left side there, there's a little bit of a raised edge um, for, from where we didn't quite press it together. Um, but if you take a the sort of ring tool that comes with it, and you smack it, you put the quarter in the ring tool, you smack it really hard on a table, it comes apart into two pieces. You separate the halves, and inside you can fit an SD card. So that's pretty cool. Um, and as you can see, if you've watched this video this far, you probably did not know that quarter was a legitimate um, escape and evasion tool. It looked just like a normal size reference thing. So that's how sneaky some of these um, escape and evasion tools can get. And we use that one quite a lot. Um, it's expensive, though. It costs um, a roughly 25 bucks for a quarter like that. But um, it's, well, it's well worth its weight if you're trying to get an SD card uh, somewhere where you shouldn't have one, like through customs or something. Um, but uh, next up is, you know, a bloodshed, you know, things like that. You can even throw in a, a, an S200 ground comm card. We tend to travel with those a lot, too. However, our comm cards that we keep, we keep them in, you know, waterproof uh, Ziploc bags, but the comm cards we have are printed on waterproof paper, or not waterproof, water-soluble paper, so that all we have to do is pour some water on it and it disappears, and we were never associated with the S2 Underground project ever. Uh, you would never know who we are. So that uh, that's something to keep in mind if you wanted to do that. Um, but yeah, that's um, yeah, that sort of shows how much of a system this stuff really is. Um, one thing to, to note is that we did not talk about, this is really just a SEER component, and one of the huge components of SEER in the military today is communications. So we didn't talk about communications at all. We didn't talk about GPSs or, or our um, you know, satellite communicators or sat phones or anything like that. All of that is part of a survival kit. Uh, we're just talking about our absolute last-ditch stuff, the stuff that we have on us or like right next to us. That if we get grabbed out of our bed in the middle of the night, what are we gonna have? And that's and that's this sort of stuff. You know, if we get you know, we're going we're standing in line at a coffee shop and we get a black bag put over our head and yanked into a, a waiting van, what do we have on us? That's this stuff. I don't carry you know a satellite phone in my you know back pocket every day, right? Um, you know, I carry it in my backpack, but it's not my back pocket. So um, just the kind of stuff that we have on our person to help sort of get out of a situation like that. Now, when we continue the series, we'll probably end up adding on because I'm sure somebody here will come up with a really good idea or they'll be like, hey, we, for we completely forgot to talk about this topic. Um, so we will talk about that in a future video. I'm sure we'll end up ending the series with sort of a hodgepodge mess of a video of like, oh, wait, I forgot um, this kind of stuff. So keep that in mind and you know some of the other considerations uh, before we end um, even though we're talking about gear um, we do have to remember though that sometimes we can have the best gear in the world but we can't escape and we can't get out of the situation and you know to draw on a sort of example again from Hollywood uh, this is from the sort of German series called um, Generation War and this is a scene in which um, there are uh, you know um, it's set in World War II right and it's set on board one of the trains to you know Auschwitz or, or Dachau and something like that. I can't remember which one it was, but one of the prisoners basically wants to escape. And as they try to take out the shiv they had hidden, and they try to uh, dig away at the floorboards, the rotting floorboards, to, to get out of the train. Uh, the other prisoners try to stop them. And you know that's that's kind of a, a Hollywood example to kind of get people's minds thinking of like, ah, oh, okay, well, what if my fellow prisoners don't want me to escape? 
And, you know, as like I mentioned before, we don't make doctrine off of movies because it's usually not true. But in this case, there are very good examples. And this is one of the great examples that we hear about. And this is, you know, the the great escape, right? The, the you know, award-winning movie and real-life story of the escape from Stalag Lift 3. Um, and we must remember that this is one of the very only, this is one of the very few cases where American or not American. Well, um, I think there were a couple of Americans. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Don't quote me on that, but there were 50 prisoners who, once they were recaptured from the great escape that were, um, essentially murdered, um, at the personal request of, of Hitler and his cronies, um, as a lesson to the others. So we must remember that you know, this is one of the more high profile cases that everyone remembers when we're talking about this, but we also have to remember that during, you know, Japan during World War II and especially Vietnam and that conflict, um, it was a common tactic for a, a hostile nation to say, okay, um, we're not going to put up any fences, but if any one of you escapes, we're going to kill everyone else. You know, for every one person that escapes, we're going to kill five of your fellow prisoners. And that served as a very good deterrent because they actually carried it, uh, carried it through with it a few times. Very few, very hard to find documentation, but it did happen um, a few times. And this is one of the, the, the more well-known cases where um, prisoners were um, executed essentially as a, as a warning to the others. So that's something to keep in mind is that you can have all the tools, you can have all the knowledge, but do you even want to escape in a certain situation? You know, that's something you're going to have to come up with on your own. And, you know, it's very hard to say. Uh, some more considerations you might want to think about is can can you even do it? Can you Once you get out, what are you going to do? Um, nowadays in 2020, it is virtually impossible to live a life as another person to have a fake identity in the United States of America. It's impossible. So, like, this is a a, a passport from uh, World War II, uh, a fake one. This is what a fake one looks like. And as you can see, it looks quite real. Um, it looks pretty much identical to the real one. In fact, uh, by the end of the war, a lot of identity papers um, looked so real that they were the the real documents were actually getting called out as being fakes. So, uh, that's not the case now. So, you know, we've got to remember that, you know, it's not like back in the day where you could have a, a fake ID business, you know, some high schooler using a cheap fake ID to get into a bar or something like that, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s. It's not like that anymore. You can't do it. It's not possible. Like most states nowadays have the real ID type thing. So you cannot create a fake identity. Um, even as we're looking forward, we're leaning forward and we're, we're, the reason we're talking about this sort of thing is is from your sort of COVID passports, right? They're hard to fake, right? They're going to be hard to fake. They're either going to be digital or they're going to be in such a way that it's very, very, very hard to get around. And, you know, the example here is that, is that we're looking forward. Um, this is a case from Dare County, North Carolina, um, which was one of the more interesting cases because they quite literally were not letting people who owned property back onto the, the islands, which can say this was a county in the uh, Outer Banks of North Carolina. So they were quite literally restricting and you had to look at all the stuff you had to have. You had to have an entry permit to get into your own property. And you, had to, you had to show that entry permit to law enforcement officers to get into your own property. So like if that doesn't you know, have, you know, inklings or if that doesn't, if that isn't reminiscent of, you know, Europe in the 1930s, I don't know what is. Um, so you know, having to apply for a permit to get onto your own land in America to transit on a public road, that's coming. It's already happened. Like, we don't need to sit here and, you know, sort of theorize. No, this is what has already happened. And the next time, you know, as we're sort of here in late November uh, 2020, we are moving forward into uh, a second wave of lockdowns. You know, a few states have locked their populations down, like California just got almost the whole state just got locked down, I think, yesterday. Um, yeah, it's, it's something to be concerned about and you should be concerned about it because you're not going to be able to fake a lot of these documents. Um, but yeah, so that's one of the considerations to think about when it comes to sort of escape and evasion in the United States is, Hey, the documents you're going to need are not fakeable. They're not fakeable with, you know, conventional tools. Now you can bypass, but that's, that's another video for another time. In fact, 
we're going to have a whole other episode on confinement escape and then, uh, you know, talking about, okay, I've gotten out of my restraints. I've got my gear. I've got some tools on me. How do I escape confinement? How do I get out of my, like in this case, this image shows an ISIS prison cell in Syria. Um, how do I get out of this sort of environment? And we're going to talk about that in another episode along with what to do once you get out and once you get out and how to, and how to stay out. So, um, I know this video has been very, very long, and I uh, thank you for staying with me um, because this is some very important stuff that not a whole lot of people um, talk about. And frankly, due to YouTube's algorithms, not a whole lot of people are going to see. So uh, we wanted to remind everyone to uh, check out our other platforms. We are on, check out our com card, especially on our website, which we will link to below if YouTube allows us to link. Um, if you haven't already done so, check out parts one and two. I know that it's a lot of content, and I know that it's a lot of listening, and it requires a lot of you know uh, attention paying and things like that. And not a whole lot of people have a lot of time, but these issues are things that we can't talk about in a short period of time. We have to give you the long-form answer for all of this because it really matters on how we present the information. Um, we can't just say, do this or do that, because it, it depends. Everything depends. So. Um, check out our other platforms for more information on this. We're going to continue this series. Hopefully we can get our, um, our handcuffs that we broke. We can get new ones in soon. Um, but we might not have that before the end of the year, to be honest, um, based on how, you know, shipping is being locked down for COVID and things like that in Europe. So we don't know. Uh, but we wanted to put this out because it's, it's information that we think is important. Uh, once again, um, so yeah, uh, check out our stuff. We're going to host this video on YouTube, but it's also going to be on um, lbry.tv, the link of which will also be below. And um, we'll also uh, link to it on all of our other platforms like Keybase and uh, Parler and things like that. We're not even going to bother with YouTube, or not YouTube, we're not even going to bother with Instagram anymore. Um, so so yeah, I, I know it's a theme the, of ours as of late, but this is a lot of heavy stuff. And, you know, we've got to remember to, that, that a lot of times nowadays in 2020, especially us here at the S2 Underground, we're walking a fine line. We're walking a fine line between, you know, sort of unnecessary paranoia and prudence and planning. And we need to make sure that we're staying on course, right? We don't want to go off the deep end and, and start making bad decisions based on, inf on things that may probably won't happen. But we also don't need to, to be blind to what is already happening. So yeah, make sure you just take care of yourself. Don't let yourself get drawn into uh, a lot of this negative type stuff that we have to think about. Um, we certainly uh, don't like to, to talk about this too much, but it's information that we have to talk about. And then, you know, we'll refer people back to this video series and things like that. We don't like to live this type of stuff because it's just not fun. It's not, it's not happy. Um, so it's good information. We do have to talk about these unpleasant topics, uh, unfortunately, more than what we would like. Uh, we would like to talk about happy uh, and, and, and good things um, more often than we do, but we're, we're not in the business of, of entertaining, right? We're in the business of sharing information and saving lives, hopefully. So um, keep that in mind. Um, stay safe out there. Make sure you take care of yourself physically and mentally, and we will see you next time. Always remember to fight in the shade, and, and uh, we'll come back at you with this next uh, episode soon. So take it easy.